Good evening. Good evening. Glad to see you all here today. I see we have some visitors with us today. We welcome you. We trust you'll be blessed as you worship with us tonight. Tonight is one of our highlights of, of our year, our annual candlelight service. It's a very special service of, of hymns and scripture reading and also a, a, a Christmas meditation. Um, just a reminder, if you have any electronic devices, uh, please turn them off completely uh, during uh, this service and any of our worship services. Um, we also welcome with us tonight uh, a guest organist, uh, Susie Stutt, or, yeah, Susie Stutt uh, Hall, uh, agreed to uh, be our organist tonight, and we do uh, thank her for that. She's done a wonderful job in a short amount of time. Don't know of any other announcements at this time, so we will begin. One other announcement. We will have a prayer meeting as usual at 7 p.m. this Wednesday, and we'll be having Christmas Day service uh, this Sunday. Uh, the time will be 10 a.m., not 11, 10 a.m. So please come and uh, worship uh, together as we celebrate the birth of our King. Let's open our congregational singing tonight by turning to hymn number 249 in the bright green hymnals that are in the pew in front of you there, and we'll stand and sing all the verses of O Come, All Ye Faithful, number 249.
people said. Amen. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, who descended to earth that he might become a man and dwell among us. And how we thank you, Father, that he bore our sins on Calvary's cross, that he died in our place and paid the full penalty of your wrath against us. How we thank you, Father, that he rose from the dead, guaranteeing that his promise of eternal life is true. And how we thank you, Father, for this time tonight when we can worship him, the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you, Father, for the incarnation. We thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ loved us enough to give himself for us. We thank you for this marvelous season of the year when we can remember his birth. And Father, we thank you for the great hymns which we sing in his praise. And so we pray for your blessings upon this service tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And for the remainder of the hymns, until we get to the last hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, uh, you may remain seated. <clears throat> so please uh, turn with me to hymn 244, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. We'll sing both verses, hymn 244. For his people. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. Let's continue our worship by turning our celebration hymnals to hymn 245, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We'll sing the first, third, and last verse. First, third, and last. Turn over to hymn 255, Lo, how a rose air blooming. This rose also referring to the rose of Sharon, our Lord Jesus. Turn please to 255, we'll sing the first and last verses. First and last verses.
Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Amen. Please turn uh, with me in your celebration hymnals again to hymn 256, Love Has Come. We'll sing the f first and last verses. 256. in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Please turn to hymn 270. We'll sing all four verses this time. Hymn 270, Joy to the World.
Amen. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Israel forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived in a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Amen. Please turn your <clears throat> excuse me. Please turn your hymn books to hymn 278. Angels we have heard on high will sing the first, third, and last verses. Hymn 278. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Amen. Let's turn to hymn 250 and we'll sing the first, second, and last verses of A Little Town of Bethlehem, hymn 250. Mm -hmm. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Please turn your hymnals to hymn 279, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. We'll sing both verses, hymn 279. Yeah. 
And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Amen. Turn over, please, to hymn 259, Angels from the Realms of Glory. We'll sing the first, second, and fifth verses. Hymn 259, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Amen. We'll go right across the page to hymn 251. It came upon the midnight clear. We'll sing the first and last verses. Hymn 251. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Christmas is the great time when we consider the gift that God gave to us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus is the Savior, as we have just read. Whenever we take an offering here at Bible Presbyterian Church, we are reminded of that great truth that salvation is a free gift from God. You cannot buy salvation. You cannot give money to a church and expect that somehow that will earn favor with God that you might just have enough to get into heaven. That's not true. Salvation is free because Jesus paid for it on the cross. So as we take our offering tonight, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, we are not asking for your money. God doesn't ask for it and neither do we. Giving is the privilege of those who are saved, those who know Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior and who, because of trusting in him, have been given the gift of eternal life. But as believers, we give because we love him who loved us first. So as we give tonight, we give in thanksgiving. We give out of love. We give because Christ first gave himself to us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, this evening as we receive these gifts and offerings from your people, we pray that you will bless them to the glory of Jesus Christ. That as we give, that our hearts might be filled with gladness and not with sorrow. That we might rejoice to be able to have anything to give at all. And so, Father, we commit these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King, our Savior. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Amen. Please turn your hymn books to hymn 290, As with Gladness Men With Old, hymn 290. called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that uh, I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Amen.
please take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 253, Silent Night, and we'll sing the first, second, and final verses, one, two, and four. And let's stand to sing number 253. and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars and she being with child cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne and I heard a voice a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Amen. Praise the Lord, O Lord. 
Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. Praise the Lord. For our meditation this evening, I'd like to go back for just a few minutes and ponder the narrative of Christ's birth that is found in the Gospel of Luke. That was back in Luke chapter 2, and we've read it already, so I just summarize it briefly. You recall that that is the narrative which tells us about the decree that Caesar Augustus gave. It explains to us that Joseph had to go all the way from Galilee and Nazareth, all the way south down into Judea to the city of Bethlehem, which is called well, the city of David. He had to be taxed not only by for himself, but he had to bring Mary along. She couldn't stay behind. Interesting how God moves people in history, even when it's very inconvenient, by some of the most strange and wonderful means. And while she's there, she gives birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the narrative that tells us about the shepherds that are in the fields. That's the narrative that tells us about all of the angels in the heavens. That's the narrative that tells us that the shepherds went out and told other people and how Mary kept these things in her heart. And then we see the shepherds praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. I'd like for you to look with me, if you will, at several very startling contrasts that are found in this passage. There are at least 15 contrasts in the passage that I want to draw your attention to. And I think that it's no accident that God chose to include those contrasts because each one of them highlights and truly does highlight the unfathomable dis difference between God and man. As we sit here this evening, we're coming to the end of a calendar year. And I suspect that probably some of you sitting here who are beginning to dread that annual ritual of preparing our income taxes. Did you notice what's going on in the passage? It begins with what many consider to be one of the greatest curses of man, taxes. But it ends with God's greatest blessing to man, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a contrast. Let me ask you a question. If you had to choose between taxes and Jesus, which would you choose? I think I know the answer that most of you would give, and it's not taxes. So doesn't it seem strange that when we phrase that question in a different way, there's a much steeper dropout rate? So let me ask this question. If you had to choose between Jesus and hell, which would you choose? Sadly, people are choosing the wrong answer to that question every day and thinking nothing about it. The passage begins with the curse of taxes. But did you ever stop to think that God never taxes us? Instead, he always gives. And he always gives his best blessings to those who come to him in faith. He has already given to us Jesus in Bethlehem. Now he offers to give you eternal life when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, what are you waiting for? What a contrast we see in that first observation. Now let's look at the second contrast between God and men. The Christmas story starts with men taking hard-earned money away from other men by legal force. If you think taxes are voluntary, just try sending a letter to the IRS stating that you think taxes are unconstitutional and that you're dropping out of the system. You say, nobody would do that. Oh, yes, they do. In fact, I know a very bright Christian man that tried that after he had studied the Constitution of the United States for years. But you know something? He is now in federal prison and has been in federal prison for more than 20 years. I'm not kidding. What a place to start the Christmas story. But look where it ends. Here's the government taking hard-earned money away from men by legal force. But it ends with God giving to man with gentle kindness. It's hard to imagine anything more gentle and tender 
than a loving mother with her newborn baby. Some of you all are moms. Remember back to those very first few minutes when the nurse put your tiny little baby on your breast and you began to nurse your baby? You know, I had the joy of seeing my wife greet one of our, every one of our dear little ones. In fact, 13 different times I observed that. It was incredible joy. It was incredible tenderness. It was incredible wonder and excitement. What a difference from the rough hand of oppressive government ripping your possessions out of your bank account. That's where the passage starts, but it ends with the gentle, tender mother and her baby. Look at the contrast between the focus that people have here in our text this evening. What differences people have in the focus of things that they look at as important in the world? The passage starts with Caesar's government focused on money and power. As far as government is concerned, that's where it's at. Money, power, more money, more power. Even here in the United States, men controlling governments have, for centuries, lied and killed and cheated and stolen and sold their integrity and bowed to the almighty dollar. And when you look at some of the more incredible dictators, the evil dictatorships of history, you cringe that people can be that wicked. What a worthless temporal focus. But look how the focus in our story changes. By the time we reach the end of this passage, instead of having governments focused on money and power, we have shepherds focused on lambs and angels. Wow. That's a shocking contrast. Money, greed, power, intimidation, theft, lying, killing, and selling out to integrity, contrasted with lambs and angels. You know, I think God is making a point. Let's look at the passage from a news media perspective. We're all deeply involved in the news media today. We sit and listen to it and hope they're telling us the truth. Let's look at this from a news media perspective. It starts with Caesar making a hated announcement. Everybody is getting a shocking announcement from the IRS. They're reading scary stories in the Ancient World Times magazine about government agents breaking into mud huts and dragging the residents off to filthy Roman dungeons for not paying their taxes. Their Iron Age radios, and of course you realize I'm speaking with tongue in cheek, their Iron Age radios are crackling off the wall with news reports of Rome hiring more IRS agents to enforce the new tax collection law. You know, that's the kind of news that sells papers and magazines off the shelf like hotcakes. But now, look at the end of that biggest scoop of the year. It ends with angels also making an announcement. But it's an announcement that causes worldwide joy. That's even better than an announcement by the angels that Caesar has decided he has enough taxes and he's going to send a rebate of 1,000 Jewish shekels to every Jewish boy at his bar mitzvah. Much better announcement the angels made. What a heavenly announcement. A savior has been born. And imagine this. It's a savior who is not going to tax you out of everything you own, including the toothpaste in your bathroom. Let's look at another contrast. Here's a contrast for the big people and the little people. It contrasts an adult king seated on a throne with an infant king lying in a food trough. Let me put it this way. Most of us put warm fuzzy edges around the manger picture. Let's get a reality check at what really happened there. We've just finished, for example, celebrating Thanksgiving a few weeks ago. Most of you are familiar with a turkey roasting pan. Can you imagine what it would be like if you had all just finished eating your big Thanksgiving meal and one of the guests goes into labor? When the baby is born, you put him in the turkey pan because it's the right size. In fact, a lot of turkeys weigh a whole lot more than even a big baby. You see, most babies range between 7 and 10 pounds, but most Thanksgiving turkeys weigh in between 18 and 22 pounds. But you know what's worse than that? What if the new mom put her baby into a dog's food dish 
because there was no place else to put him. Mary put him into a food trough for animals. Dear friends, that's a picture of intense poverty that Luke is describing. What a contrast. Powerful Caesar is sitting on a fancy throne in all his wealthy arrogance, surrounded by his dullard drones and yes-men. But the God who created the entire universe is lying in an animal food dish all tied up in rag scraps. And yet, it's very beautiful because it means that there is no person so low that the Savior can't identify with him and reach down to him and save him. Let's look at the next contrast in the text. It starts with Romans and rejectors of the Holy Family asleep in bed in the inn. Hey man, says one, glad I got here early. Look at all those mobs of people. Yeah, I made my reservations in advance and flew in early so I could get in a few rounds of ping pong with the local camel boy. Say, did you see the pregnant girl that was there with her husband trying to get a room a few minutes ago? Hey, listen, man, don't try to put a guilt trip on me. Yeah, I saw them, but that's their tough luck. You're not giving up your room, so why should I give up my room? You know, the Romans don't care if it's tough on her. They want their taxes, and I want my room. Bad timing on her part to be pregnant now. Y'all, I'm going to hit the sack. Don't make any noise, and don't even wake me up if the whole sky lights up with aliens. That's the kind of attitude. I know those aren't their words, but that's the attitude of the folks who were there at the end when Joseph and Mary came. It begins with Romans and careless rejectors, but look how it ends in that passage. It ends with Jewish shepherds who are ready to hear, who are ever vigilant, ever awake through the long nights because they're watching over their flocks by night. Contrast number seven. The passage begins with human habitations. There are at least three of them mentioned in the text. Rome, the seat of power. Nazareth, the seat of heritage and the Bethlehem Inn, which should be the seat of hospitality and comfort. And yet Joseph and Mary are not able to take advantage of any of that. You see, humans have no time for the God who created them. But the animal creation that night had room for him. The passage begins with human habitations. It ends with animal habitations, a stable. Animals, not people, watch as baby Jesus, their very creator, is born. The people don't see him until afterwards. Contrast number eight. For most of the world, it's just another night in tax season. Hope to get our taxes done on time so we don't have to pay a penalty, like getting our heads cut off or something like that. Nothing special about tonight, except it means we'd better get our taxes finished soon. It's dark. Let's hit the sack. We'll call the accountant in the morning. But to God, this is the holiest of nights. Look how the passage begins. The holiest night begins in darkness and silence. For the rest of the world, it's a time to pack up shop and go home. Hope the wife is cooking some juicy matzo ball soup. Hope the kids did okay in school today. Hope the rotten Romans didn't steal any more of my sheep. What a dull life. Wonder what it'll be like around here in a hundred years. Wish something exciting other than the Romans would happen around here. Do we live that way, sort of a humdrum life? We have no eagerness, no expectancy, no excitement, even though Jesus has promised that he is going to come again. We just keep on living and we pay no attention to what God might be doing in our lives. But you know that extraordinary night ends in a blaze of angelic light. It ends with the birth of the one who himself is the light of the world. I wish you could have been with us this morning when we saw this as stated by Jesus himself that this is one of the key purposes for which he came into the world. In other words, being the light of the world is central to the purpose of the incarnation. 
Now let's look at the emotional contrasts in the passage. Oh, we see some real emotions here. The human fear of the shepherds is contrasted with the angelic command, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. Did you know that there are over 150 places in the Bible where we are told to fear not or be not afraid? Over 150 times, God has to tell us that. You see, fear is natural to the human condition. But God has incredible blessings in store for us. God is good. He wants us to trust him. Fear not, for behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. You know, there's so many contrasts here in the text. We can't study them all tonight, and we are running out of time at this point. So let me just mention a few more. Look at the contrast between verse 1 and verse 11. The human oppression in verse 1 is contrasted with the divine salvation in verse 11. Look at the contrast between the shepherds and the angels. There were only a few shepherds, but there was a multitude, thousands of the heavenly host. Look at the contrast between the role reversals found in the text. The multitude announced the message to the few, but then the few were told to announce the message to the multitude. Look at the contrast between how God began the message and how he finishes the message. You know, God could have used the angels as the exclusive messengers and would never have had to use any lazy, slothful, fearful, compromising people. He didn't have to use us. We could have had a situation where only angels brought the message of salvation, for example, to the mission field. There would never have been any successful opposition. There would never have been any failures. There would have never been any lack of missionary funding support. There would never have been any commissioned messengers who decided to stay home and make lots of money and watch TV. But you know, God didn't decide to use only angels. The passage ends with God choosing to use people to spread the message of good news. You know, that's why we have churches and missionaries today. A contrast was set in the Christmas story, and now we have the privilege of telling others also. How about this contrast? The obedient faith of the shepherds in going to see is contrasted with the wonderful curiosity of the others who heard it, but did not come to Christ. They all wondered at the things that were told them by the shepherds. But none of them bothered to stop eating their popcorn, playing their video games, and looking at the discount ads on the local parchment newsletters. Hmm. You know, it sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? Let me give you one final contrast, number 15. I think this is important. The angels had to disappear before the shepherds realized that the real event of the evening was Jesus, not angels. You know, we all like the flashy, exciting stuff. We like the big concerts, the hypnotic hands raised over their heads, the wiggling bodies swaying in time with a rock band on the stage, the strobe lights, the ear-shattering, mind-numbing music belching out of the speakers. But friends, it's not a sky filled with shiny angels in white robes singing the hallelujah chorus that's important. It's the baby in the manger because he is greater than all the angels in heaven combined. How easy it is for us to lose sight of the meaning of Christmas with all the lights, all the trees, the shopping, the bargains, the wish list, the temporal focus. It's only when we turn our eyes away from Macy's to the manger, from Sears to the stable, from Walmart to the wise men, and from covetousness to Christ, will we ever understand why Christmas has a personal importance for us. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. There's the central purpose of the Incarnation. The purpose of Bethlehem. The purpose of God coming down from heaven. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I'm a sinner. You are a sinner also. Jesus came to earth to save me. 
Jesus came to earth to save you. Forget the other stuff. Christ is not about the other stuff. Christmas is not about the other stuff. It's about Jesus coming to save you. And how does Jesus save us? What good news does God provide so that we can know for sure? The Bible explains it over in Romans 1, 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Oh, we've read some of those tonight. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. He was born in Bethlehem because he was of the seed of David and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holiness by the resurrection from the dead. His death, burial, and resurrection, Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians 15. So how are we supposed to respond to receive that gracious gift of salvation? You know, it's easy. God doesn't make it hard to receive his gift. In Acts 16, there was a man who cried out with this question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Listen to what the apostles responded in Acts 16, 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house. Did you notice there are no good works involved? It doesn't cost any money. You don't have to help little old ladies across the street before God will consider you for salvation. You don't have to join some group. All you have to do is trust Jesus with your whole heart to save you. And he will. It's not emotion that saves you. But it's also not merely an intellectual nod of the head. But it is so simple that a child can do it. It's what the Bible calls faith. Without faith... It is impossible to please God. You have to trust him. Dear friend, please don't leave tonight without having received God's free gift, the gift of eternal life through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem so long ago. Receive him as your savior. It will be the best gift that you ever in all of your life received. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you for the great salvation that he has provided for us. How we thank you that in that manger so long ago, God became man. He came down from heaven that he might dwell among us, live a perfect sinless life. Show us who you are and then die for our sins. How we thank you, Father, that he didn't stay dead. How we thank you that he rose from the dead, giving guaranteed proof that his offer of eternal life is true, and that all who place their faith in him receive that gift, that wonderful gift called salvation and the guarantee of heaven forever. Father, I pray that if there is even one person here tonight who does not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, that tonight you might quicken their heart, that you might irresistibly draw them to Christ, that you might give them saving faith, cause them to believe, and then fill their hearts and lives with joy and gladness. Even the joy that the shepherds felt as they heard the angels singing in the heavens, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men and then cause them to follow after the Lord Jesus. Because in him is only the one who can give life and then not merely the security of eternal life in heaven, but life now. A life that is joyful, a life that is profitable, a life that brings you glory, a life that is a testimony to the world around us. So Father, we pray that you'll cause each one of us to take what we have heard tonight from your word and only from your word and that you by your spirit will apply it to our lives that we might live for Jesus. For we pray these things in his name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to our final hymn for tonight, number 277.
277 Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We will